Uh, let's start, I want to start by asking each one of you in your own words uh, to tell us briefly what state is the American economy in right now and how do you see that breaking down uh, along racial and, and socioeconomic lines? Dean Baker, I'm going to start with you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, and thanks, Maya and Sarah, for Global Policy Solutions for arranging this great forum and having me here. Um, very quickly, what I would say is we're still very far from having recovered from the downturn, which is, you know, a horrible story. It's not as though things were so great if we go back to 2006, 2007, but we're very, very far from making up that lost ground, and it doesn't look like we're going to do that anytime soon. We got a weak GDP report uh, yesterday. A lot of people said that was due to the weather. That's right, um, but the point was the economy would be growing weakly even had we had good weather. Um, so the point is we're not making up lost ground, or certainly not very quickly. And that's a really big problem. I mean, sometimes we talk about GDP like it's a baseball score, but the point here is this is people's lives. So, you know, again, the most important numbers I could think of if we look at the job market, the unemployment rate overall doesn't look too bad. We know that the employment rate, the percentage of the population employed, is still down by around three percentage points. That's about four and a half million people from where it was before the downturn. And disproportionately, we know this is a story of people of color being unemployed. And a simple rule of thumb that you'll find fits remarkably well. The overall black unemployment rate is typically two times the white unemployment rate. So you, we've heard it before I stepped in at uh, Representative Maloney's talk. She referred to an unemployment rate among African Americans that's over 10%. Okay, the unemployment rate for whites is, I think, 4.7 in the latest data. An even more striking number, and again, pretty good rule of thumb, the unemployment rate for African American teens is typically six times the unemployment rate for whites. And currently, it was down last month, but generally the unemployment rate for African American teens in this recovery has been over 30 percent. And it's pretty striking when we look at the events in Baltimore or other cities around the country, you have a lot of people that have pretty hopeless prospects when you're talking about unemployment rates in those inner city areas that are almost certainly over 40, probably over 50 percent. So this is why it's more than a baseball score. Um, we have to get stronger growth. We have to get the unemployment rate down. We can do it. I'm old enough to remember, some of you are not probably, but the late 90s, we saw actually very good gains for people of color, African American teens, far from perfect, far from anything people should be happy about, but things were going in the right direction. We can get back there and we should demand an economy that gets us there. All right, William Spriggs. Uh, thank you and I wanna thank um, Maya for organizing this. The smartest hire I made was when I hired Maya when I was at the National Urban League. So um, <laughs> the rest of y'all continue to get the dividends. <laughs> So um, I, I want to echo uh, what Dean said. The first quarter showed much slower growth. The result was the labor market did not show the same response we've seen at the end of 2014 where we saw a very rapid growth rate in hiring. So firing is down, but we get unemployment down by having hiring go up the groups that are most sensitive showed it because the last three months consecutively the unemployment rate for adult black women went up. So um, the, the, the mere slowing of the economy has already worsened things in the African American community. The deep reality behind the two to one unemployment rate for African Americans is that this is driven in very large part by discrimination. Unique among all groups, African Americans have a higher unemployment rate at every level of education compared to whites. The two to one isn't simply that it's twice, it's twice if you're a college grad, it's twice if you're a high school grad, it's twice if you're an associate degree holder, it's twice if you're a dropout. The unemployment rate for all other racial groups for high school dropout, for high school dropout is less than the black unemployment rate. The unemployment rate for Latino dropouts, Asian dropouts, white dropouts, that their unemployment rate is lower than the black unemployment rate. When we allow the labor market to be soft, we make the cost of discrimination lower. Now, monthly, these numbers are very erratic because we don't seasonally adjust them and the sample sizes are small. 
but to understand how extreme this can be. Among 16 to 24 year olds, and again the sample sizes get small, but just understand how extreme these things can be. Uh, in February, when the market, the labor market was slowing down, 16 to 24 year olds completed school. So here we're looking at very new high school graduates, very new college graduates. The unemployment rate for whites who were dropouts was lower than the unemployment rate for blacks who are college graduates. That can only happen when the labor market is so slack that employers are free to pick and choose whoever they want. Unfortunately, when we discuss African American unemployment, there's this tendency to want to talk about education, there's this tendency to want to talk, talk about where jobs are and where jobs aren't. Uh, but we know from many match pair examples where we take two people, same resume, and send them to the employer. We know that you get different outcomes when the employer can identify the applicant as being African American. That level of discrimination can only be chased away by a tight labor market. So, so the reality is that as Dean said, we are a long way from getting back to full employment. And, it, and as Dean was saying, it's not getting back to 2007. Because in 2007, the median household income in the United States hadn't recovered to 2001. Yeah. So this is a, a deeper and broader long-term uh, problem that we're trying to recover from. All right, and before I go to William Emmons, I just want to say we're going to reserve the last 15 minutes of our time starting at 12 o'clock for audience questions, so start to think about what you'd like to, to ask uh, the panelists. William Emmons. Just make the point, uh, reinforce the point that there's a lot of volatility in the numbers. The year-over-year -year growth actually is 3% through the first quarter, which is near the, near the best levels of this recovery. 5.5% employment, the best of this uh, for many, many years. Stock market, of course, has recovered. Housing markets look better. But of course, we know that that's just at the, the top level. If you look below the surface, uh, the groups that were most affected by the boom and the bust were the more vulnerable groups, younger families, those with lower levels of education, and uh, blacks and Latinos. And so that's, uh, as I said, you have to remember that, that those were the groups that were lifted, and I agree that the boom times uh, also lift those vulnerable groups faster. And so I think the challenge is uh, how do we avoid the big booms and big busts? How do we get more sustainable growth? Heather Boucher. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I wanted to just summarize. I, I think this is one of those issues where you see wide agreement among economists, not just those up here on the panel today, but there is wide agreement that our economy is stuck, that um, we are not yet back to full employment, and that um, economic conditions, wherever they are, you know, where, whatever level the employment rate is, it is always worse for people of color, Hispanics, and then it's always even worse typically for African Americans. So the, the number one economic goal needs to get our economy back to full employment. Um, and so I just wanted to echo that, that you know, you, you're just looking at four economists here, but I think these are generally widespread um, uh, in agreement on this. I wanted to make two points. Um, one, I think, and a couple of people have sort of uh, nudged at this a little bit, the economy that we're seeing today needs to be put into its longer-term context. I think it was Bill um, Spriggs who made the point that even though we haven't recovered our employment rate back to where it was in 2007, 2007 was a recovery that hadn't recovered back to where we had been in 2000. And I believe it was Dean who made the point that the late 1990s were the best labor market that we've seen certainly in my lifetime um, and um, you know since then. So this is not just a short-term uh, problem that we're seeing in terms of today's labor market. It is part of a longer-term trend. Which leads to my second point, which is um, one of the biggest questions that economists are facing is how do we get back to full employment? How do we get to the kind of economy that creates wealth and shared prosperity for everyone that is not bubble driven? Um, because we've been living in eras where one after one uh, we've seen these bubbles that have been driving our economy and propelling it forward. Um, 
but that's not really a viable long-term strategy, as we've all seen. And while it might be nice in the moment to have this burst and to have this, you know, this growth that is bubble-driven, the consequences when those bubbles pop can be catastrophic and leave millions of people without jobs and um, just, you know, and to remind you, without a livelihood, there's a lot of things that we can't do in life. So I think one of the, I know as we get forward in this uh, conversation, I hope we can start talking about some of the, the policy recommendations, but also thinking about the ways that we can push our economy forward that isn't bubble driven, I would like to put on the table that one of them is really taking seriously the kinds of inequality that we've seen in our economy growing in recent decades along all economic axes and that addressing that is one way to think about moving away from a bubble driven economy and moving towards an economy of broadly shared prosperity. Okay, well that's a, that, that will be a good segue in a moment. Of course, I do want to get to prescriptions for uh, how to change the picture that you're all describing. But before we do that, I want to ask each one of you, I'm going to start with you, um, Bill Emmons, on this, and that is, what are the policies in place that have led to the situation we find ourselves in today? I mean, you've all touched on this, but let's, let's pinpoint that for a minute. What's, what's wrong with this picture today that makes this uh, inequality possible? Are you thinking of the overall kind of boom bust overall, or the? Yeah. Well, it, I'm talking about uh, you know both sort of macro conditions, but I'm also talking about policy prescriptions that have been uh, enacted by previous and current uh, political leaders. Uh, yeah, I guess well, let me say just a, a word on the boom bust. Is is I think we were we're trying for faster growth than was really realistic in the early 2000s. And on that point, Heather, I mean I think there is room for debate about whether that late 90s uh, burst of growth was sustainable. Yep. Um, so I think that, that created kind of a bad um, uh, overall environment of trying too hard in the 2000s, say, to recreate that, that boom of the 90s. But maybe below the surface, um, you know, you'd have to point, in, given our recent experience, to, the, to maybe the housing market. That we, you know, the way we tried to create that growth in the 2000s to try to recreate the fast growth of the 90s was to say that uh, we should uh, use our housing market and the wealth that was created. And, and the Federal Reserve was very much uh, in that discussion, talking about the wealth effects that were uh, across the, the population, but of course uh, increased the, the number of families that were involved. So I guess I would uh, say that that was, looking back, that was the one that has had the most impact on the most families. What else, what, uh, what else would you all say is, is responsible for the situation we find ourselves in? Well, I think it's a longer term trend. When you look back at uh, the post-World War II growth, it was that wages went with productivity. So we had broad shared prosperity because as the economy became more productive, everyone benefited. From 1980 on, we have a huge wedge between the productivity of American workers and their wages, and that creates a conundrum. Uh, we did something else in the 1980s. We de-invested in the public commons. We went to a language that was far more reliant on the market allocating everything, and now we are at the perverse level of having, without public debate, decided that college ought to be driven by tuition when the history of the United States is that uh, colleges were out of a public endowment, out of private endowments, and this is globally the case as well. So one of the issues that gets confronted is that with productivity rising but wages staying stagnant, the bottom 80, 90 percent keep control of a smaller and smaller share of the economy. And the result is that you can't get the desired outcome through private consumption to sustain the economy, whether it's college or housing. And further, because the top 10 percent consume a way disproportionate share of private housing and college, the market price is driven to where the dollars are. And so that means that those at the median fall behind and we do get bubbles because in order to do the fundamental things, buy a house, get a college degree, if you're going to make it market driven, that means I have to borrow because you've moved the price point 
not in line with my productivity, not in line with the way society is going, but with what's happening at the top 1%, not what's happening for the rest of us. Getting rid of our unions is we move the voice of workers and how do we distribute that productivity? Does it go back to Americans or does it go to the top 1%? And we've had trade deals that have reduced the bargaining mm -hmm. power of workers even further. So I think that has created this inequality that makes the market-based public policy we now have unsustainable. And particularly because African Americans neither have income nor wealth, prices them out of housing, prices them out of college. Well, and if Raise I, a lot of elements, I, Heather. And let then me add being. a couple of things to that. I mean, it doesn't just price them out of housing, of course. It prices them out of, I mean, a big reason for uh, notwithstanding housing bubbles, but for rising home prices in many communities is because those are where the good schools are. And so being priced out of housing isn't just being priced out of a home or an asset. It's actually being priced out of future economic opportunity, which is so absolutely critical. Uh, a colleague of mine um, refers to this as opportunity hoarding, which I think is just such an apt phrase for what we've seen happen in America, especially across place, where some communities have access to resources and that those prices are bid up and up, and so only people who can afford to get in those communities have access to the, to the public goods that all of us should be able to benefit from. So I think you asked about what policies have made this happen, I think policies that have allowed those kinds of differences across place in access to the opportunities that um, can propel people forward is really important. But I wanted to add a second, another one, I mean, I, I completely agree with Bill, too, on the um, the, the importance of, of unions and the, the gap between productivity and wages. But I think we need to talk, when we're thinking about what's happened in the economy, we need to think about what's happened at the top, the middle, and the bottom. And thinking about the top, We've lived through an era that I think is not over yet of a financial sector that is, quite frankly, too often out of control. Um, uh, we've seen deregulation. We've seen a change in the rules of the road in terms of the role of finance in our economy, the size of it in our economy, the way that it is siphoning off the best and the brightest from what I would dare say are important public service jobs like medicine or healthcare or, which are the same thing, medicine and healthcare, education was what I meant to say, or other creative endeavors and focusing um, the talent of many of our, the best and the brightest on the financial sector, which is one way that we've siphoned out the wealth of our economy, but there are a variety of other ways that we've allowed um, through many uh, important policy changes and, and deregulation uh, to change the rules of the road for the U.S. economy. And I think if we want to move away from a bubble-driven economy, we're going to have to confront those front and center. Uh, Dean I'll Baker. A, I'll make a couple points. First, agreeing with you know, both Bill and Bill Spriggs and Heather. Uh, unions, I think, is a really important part of the story. And we go back to 1980, roughly 20 percent of our workforce is unionized. Today, it's around 10 percent. There's a tendency for a lot of people to go, well, that just happened, lost manufacturing jobs, this and that. We did a little study, just a very simple thing. We looked at a country you might have heard of that's similar to the United States in many ways called Canada. Um, there, there's no comparable decline. I mean, it's down one or two percentage points, but really Canada does, doesn't have a very different unionization rate today than it did back in the 70s. The point being, this was policy. You know, you could argue it was good policy, it was bad policy. They made policy choices in Canada that were consistent with maintaining reasonably high unionization rates. We went the opposite way here. I don't want to go into details here, but I think that, you know, pretty well establishes the point. The second point, just to put a point that the other Bill, Bill Emmons, was making, I want to just distinguish um, a very important point for us as nerdy macroeconomists, but, I, but again, for public understanding as well. There are two different arguments we could say about the macroeconomy, and you know, not to argue which is right, which is wrong, but when we look at the period of the housing bubble years, you know, 2002, 2006, 2007, there's a question, were we trying to grow too rapidly given our supply constraints, or was the question we needed more demand? So Bill was putting forward an argument, you can correct me if I'm misrepresenting you, that we were trying to push above the economy's speed limit. We we're trying to push demand faster than what the economy could do. Um, I would argue that, no, we had a problem that we had inadequate demand. And we were filling that with a bubble, very, very stupid thing to do, because bubbles burst and it isn't pretty. Um, but the problem was we had a lack of demand. And the question, if the perspective, if the issue is you have a lack of demand, the question is why, Bill Spriggs and Heather both raised very good points. It's upward redistribution of income. Bill Gates spends a smaller share. We give him another $1,000. He's going to spend probably zero of it. You give us some, we'll spend some of it. You give low-income people $1,000, they'll spend probably all of it because they need it. 
So that's part of the story. The other part that I think is hugely important is trade. And this is a little different than a trade story you often hear. Part of the trade story is, you know, we put our manufacturing workers in competition with people earning a dollar an hour in China. Well, that's downward pressure on their wages, no doubt about that. But the other part is simply, we have a large trade deficit. We didn't always have a large trade deficit. And this is kind of straight, you know, I always say everything I need to know about economics I learned in Econ 101. This is Econ 101. Um, aggregate demand is consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. Okay, net exports, we go back to the, you know, back to the 50s, 60s, we actually had trade surpluses. But we had modest trade deficits through most of the 70s, 80s, 90s. We got very large trade deficits beginning late 90s. Right now, trade deficits are 3% of GDP, it's over 500 billion. That's a gap in demand. From the standpoint of the economy, that's the same thing as if we took 500 billion and stuffed it under our mattress. Okay, it's very hard to make up that gap in demand. We made it up in the late 90s, the stock bubble. We made it up in the last decade with the housing bubble. That's not a good way to do it. So I would really put trade front and center. It's a longer story about currency prices, but you know, I'll just leave it at that. I think that's a really, really big part of the story. All right, Bill Evans, do you want to respond to what he said? Have a comment? I think, I think you're right, Dean, in, in uh, contrasting those positions, but I don't think there's a, a disagreement at the level of, you know, absent the housing bubble, demand was deficient. Yeah. And, and maybe to Heather's point, maybe that's partly because of where the money was or where the, where the wage growth was coming. So I'm, I'm agreeing with you in the sense that uh, you could imagine a different set of policies or different distributions of income and wealth that could have created that demand, but I don't see where else it comes from. Uh, on its own. Uh, in other words, I don't think the housing bubble was crowding out other sources, incipient sources of demand. I just think they weren't there. Yeah. All right, I so don't. anybody else on this, on this, you know, what, what is it that's led to the place we find ourselves before we start talking about what needs to change? I will just note, I mean, on this comment, I mean, uh, uh, and people who've heard me speak have heard me talk about this before. Uh, over the past year, I've been a little obsessed with some work by two economists, um, Atif Mian and Amir Sufi, who wrote Put, this pull book. Pull the mic closer oh, to sorry. Yeah. Um, Atif Mian and Amir Sufi, who wrote this book called House of Debt, where they looked at the intersection between um, who took out loans during the run-up of the housing bubble um, and how the um, crisis played its way out across space across the United States. And one of the things that they found, and they, they, one of the reasons they were able to do this is because we have a lot of data now that we didn't have even 5, 10, 15 years ago that economists can play with to really understand the way that our economy looks in local areas. And um, their argument is that uh, it was the, the communities where there were more subprime loans were the ones that not only burst first, but that the, the, the reverberations to the demand in the community was stronger because those, the, those loans had been pushed on families who were um, more likely to be on the edge, lower income overall. And one of the things that I take from that is that we need to take very seriously in ways that we haven't before the way that inequality, the, the way that inequality looks across place and looks across our economy actually affects the macroeconomic variables. So when we think about that, the housing bubble, that actually played out in homes all across America. And then, you know, in terms of individual family spending patterns, which has big differences, as Dean pointed out, how much you, you know, if you get in that thousand dollars at the top or the bottom, that plays a big role. But thinking about the role of inequality as this pernicious sort of foundation in terms of how we're thinking about the economy, it, leads to a lot of really important questions. Okay, so let's talk about what, we, what you've all been leading up to, and that is what needs to change, what needs to be adjusted, what needs to be overhauled, whether it's a macro and I mean, whether it's actions that be taken by the Federal Reserve, by the Congress, by our education system. I mean, let's think broadly, and I know all of you do. Bill Spriggs, why don't you begin? Well, again, the, the big challenge is at this hyper level of inequality, can the bottom 80% who controls such a small share of aggregate consumption sustain either economic growth or sustain the things we know we need to take place? And Heather has, uh, at her center, been talking a lot about inequality. And one of the things we have broad agreement, whether it's the OECD or the IMF, is that at this hype level inequality, one of the key things is that we don't see enough education you don't get enough human capital because you price the bottom 80% out of it. So one of the things we must do is we must return to a model where uh, we view uh, public higher education as a public good, not as a private good to be done through 
tuition. We must stay on guard against discrimination, particularly in that regard. Um, Bill, uh, the other Bill here, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, has, has kept track of this. Um, the, the problem for African Americans isn't going to college, it's college completion. If you look at uh, the, the, the last baby boom cohort, those who, who, who were in the 1960-64 uh, uh, cohort, you see that the gap in college completion between blacks and whites was smaller. The later cohort, you see the completion rate gap get bigger. The ones who went in the, who were born in the 60s, uh, the University of California Berkeley tuition for in-state, you could work at McDonald's, part of this gets back to the minimum wage that Carolyn Maloney and Congressman Scott are fighting to raise. But if, if you worked at the minimum wage in the summer uh, at, at McDonald's, you could pay for the University of California Berkeley. If you had a Pell Grant, you could pay for the University of California Berkeley. Why? Because the University of California, Berkeley, was getting a pub the equivalent of a public endowment. The amount of money we were investing meant that just like for Harvard, Harvard does not run on tuition. Harvard runs on its endowment. And so if you're going to make a college run on tuition, you, 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 you outprice it. So a gap is that. Another gap is discrimination. Uh, the, those who were in the 60s, 64, benefited from affirmative action. African Americans got access to the well-endowed public institutions. Today, if you don't play basketball or football, you are not at one of those institutions. You know, we always tell our kids, don't play basketball, don't play football. At UCLA, if you are a black freshman and you're not running track, playing football, wrestling, tell me who you are, because I think there are three of you. I can probably put you right there. So, so what we have done, just like in the housing boom, the housing boom and the predatory lending came about because we discriminated against access to fair and decent credit in the African American and Latino community. We chased those communities into the subprime market. Similarly, we have chased blacks who are far more likely, if you control for income, blacks are the one group in America who seek more education than anybody. Black people internalize that I must have more education. It's real. They know they need it because that's the only way blacks can get their unemployment rate down to single digits. It's the only way you can get your income above the poverty level. So they want the education. And so that's where the private for-profit colleges are now sucking up the money out of the black community. So what's the solution? I'm going to move so, you along because so, I want to get to so, everybody here. So solutions are, are several fold. We must re-endow our public universities. We must re-endow our public universities that particularly take on a high share of Pell eligible students. We cannot simply re-endow the schools that have gone to the elite model. We must endow those schools which have a high share of Pell Grant eligible students. And re-endowing our land grant universities means re-endowing the, the Second Moral Act, which are the African American Is that American with state dollars, federal dollars, or both? Yes, they have to be re-endowed. And, and we must restore two problems that were different for the 60s and the 80 black cohort. The 60s cohort benefited because under Social Security benefits, if your parent died or was disabled, you as a child received benefits until you were 21 or graduated from college. When we changed that in 1981, the black college completion rate dropped precipitously because African Americans are far more likely to be in the group where a parent has died or is receiving disability. And so those students don't get that income anymore. That's a big difference between 60 and, and, and 80, the, those birth cohorts. We changed the AFDC to TANF, and we made it work first, making it so that women on welfare could not pursue a college degree dramatically reduced college enrollment for single parent black women, dramatically, because they were not given the opportunity to do um, college education. So if, if, if we're going to make up for the wealth gap in the African-American community, we have to make college a public 
investment. We have to restore what we had in terms of Social Security benefits, and we must restore that college is what we really want someone who is receiving public assistance to be pursuing. Okay, we're going to ask everybody else to weigh in and uh, tell us what needs to change and how and where is the money coming from. Okay. okay. Go ahead. All right, I'll try to be quick here. Um, first off, I'm going to steal a great line from President Obama, don't do stupid things. And I understand he meant that in the context of foreign policy, but I'm going to say it in terms of the Fed. You know, the Fed raising rates, trying to slow the economy, trying to keep people from getting jobs, that's a really, really bad move. Um, last thing on earth they should be looking to do, at least anytime soon. Um, second thing, I was talking about the trade deficit. This is a story of currency values. I don't want to get into the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty, but we need to get the dollar down against other currencies. China's currency is the most important here, but it's not the only one. That's the story of the trade deficit. People could talk about more education. That's good, important for the reasons Bill and others have said. We need better infrastructure. Again, good and important. That's not going to reverse a $500 billion trade deficit, at least not in my lifetime and probably not yours. Um, so you've got to talk about getting the dollar down. That really has to be front and center. A third point that we've made a little progress, certainly at the state and local level, and even someone at the federal level, we should be talking, we have this idea of work family issues, you've probably heard the term work family. People often talk about that like we have a, a wage agenda, you know, an economic agenda, and then over here, work family. And it's a little bizarre. I remember years ago there was a dispute in L.A. with their basketball team where there was a falling out among the coaches, and they said, well, this coach will deal with defense and this coach will deal with offense. Well, you have one team, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, work family is worker issue, is wage issue. A lot of people, obviously disproportionately women, but not just women, lose their job because they have a sick kid that they're going to stay at home with. You know, this just should not happen. It's a simple enough thing. Every other wealthy country, even a lot of poorer countries in the world, have paid sick days, paid family leave. Really simple thing, make a huge difference in the lives of tens of millions of people. That should be front and center on our agenda. Bill Spriggs. I'm sorry, Bill Emmons. My focus has been on uh, strengthening families' balance sheets, which will have an effect on the overall economy. The things we look at are liquidity, diversification, and leverage. Liquidity, I think there is a, a real role for consumer protection, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and all of the state agencies in cracking down on wealth depleting uh, institutions like payday lending. That, I think, is a huge, um, maybe not a direct, but an indirect spur to helping families have more liquid balance sheets so that they're not uh, tempted maybe to use uh, wealth depleting institutions. As far as diversification, I've kind of made the point before, I think the policy mix was skewed too much toward housing and I think encouraging more financial savings, whether it's through the MyRA or other sorts of uh, saving incentives that really uh, make it attractive for people to, to build financial wealth. And on uh, leverage, I mean, a simple thing would be to uh, take away the tax deductibility of debt. Well, that's never going to happen, probably. But what about more specifically how, again, the skew toward uh, mortgage borrowing? What about re either eliminating or somehow reforming the mortgage interest deduction to make it more equitable or, or even to reduce the overall amount and to redeploy those uh, funds in other more productive areas? This has been a long list of great ideas. Um, and many of you have stolen the ones I wanted to talk about, so that's Fantastic. Let me make one comment on something Dean said, which is that we could start talking about a competitive dollar, not a dollar that's up or down, but one that is actually boosts U.S. economic competitiveness. Um, I had three points I wanted to make on this. I mean, first, when we're thinking about the policy map, I think it would be incredibly helpful to start from where we want, where, do, where is it that we want to go. When we economists say good economy, what we really mean is a United States where everyone can achieve a safe and decent standard of living and get the things that they want out of life. And I think starting from there and looking at all of our policy making that affects the quote unquote economy through that lens would be a really helpful place to start because there's a lot of things that we would just have to sort of take out of the list because they don't actually improve shared prosperity. Um, second, I don't think that, um, and I think sort of this panel definitely is indicative of this, there's not one magic bullet to solve what ails us right now, but there are a variety of packages that we can put together that add up, where a lot of small things will add up to something really big. Um, and, you know, Dean already talked about issues around work family, certainly the, the household balance sheet issues. There's a lot of uh, things that we need to put together, but I think keeping an eye 
on making sure that we're focusing our attention on how to pull the bottom up, how to strengthen the middle so that there's good jobs for people at the bottom to go into. It's one of my pet peeves when people just want to talk the bottom and I'm like, well, yeah, but getting somebody a dollar over the poverty line does not help you if there aren't good jobs and a lot of them in the middle for people to move up and into. Um, and that's for both men and, men and women, for people of all races and backgrounds, including um, immigrants. And we really need to be thinking about creating that strong middle again. But then what are we doing at the top. I have the honor of working with some amazing economists who work on tax policy, um, and one of them is Emmanuel Saez, who's an a, a award-winning economist out at Berkeley, who's written a series of papers making these very sophisticated, fancy economic arguments that say that we could increase taxes for folks at the top up to 80 percent and it will have no bad effects on U.S. economic growth. That is a very powerful new set of empirically driven research that's now like inches high that we didn't have a few years ago that I think we need, really need to be taking out to the streets and doing something with. And I want to end with my third one, which is um, to focus a little bit on the focus of this panel, which is racial wealth inequality or racial inequality, which is that, I mean, this is such a auspicious moment here in the United States to be thinking about um, racial economic inequality when we're seeing all of these things happen in, happening in terms of civil rights and, and what's going on in the streets around America. I think we need to take some time to think about the inner, and I'm glad that, that the conveners of this conference have put these together to force us to take some time to think about the intersection between economic inequality and um, uh, uh, civil rights. Um, but there's some, there's a lot of things that we need to do. A couple that I've heard people talk about literally over the past couple days that I will throw out are really making sure that we're doing what we can to enforce or to make, make it not a crime to talk about pay. Um, you know, for many workers in America, if they actually talk about pay with their colleagues, what they're earning, they can be reprimanded at the workplace. But there's no way, there is no way that we can actually fight pay inequality by race, by gender, by anything else if people actually don't know what their colleagues are making. And it used to be that unions were there keeping tabs on that. When you had a union, they knew what everybody was earning so that you could fight inequality. Right now, for most workers don't have that. They can't talk to their colleagues and we don't have any transparency. So a couple of ideas are pushing the kinds of pay transparency that we see in the Paycheck Fairness Act, but then second, also doing something to have companies report their earnings by race, by gender, to the EEOC, so that when we see systemic discrimination, we can do something about it. All right, a lot of perspective.